So it's a pleasure to welcome Ian Chambers, Managing Director, Head of Wealth Management Australia for global investment banking giant Morgan Stanley as the next guest in our interview series. Ian, pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. Reflecting on the current economic environment, I'll be interested to get your perspective on the major themes that are driving public markets at the moment. Yeah, look, Rob, um, first of all, thank you, obviously, uh, for your time and, and being here. Um, the word I'd use is transition. Um, for the last two years, we've lived um, in a world of, of global pandemic. Um, we've seen government response. Um, we've seen central bank response. Uh, we've seen a desire globally uh, to keep um, economic growth um, as best we can moving forward. I feel now we're in that period of transition. We've had some consequence of that. Uh, we've had inflation. Um, and at the moment, I sense there's a little bit of tug of war going on around that transition. What does that look like? How permanent will inflation be? Inflation's a key theme. What will be government and central bank response to that? The initial moves by the central bank, and they're very public, um, is one of uh, dealing with inflation around a genuine schedule uh, over the next 18 months of um, interest rate rises. Um, the thing we don't know uh, in relation to that is how ultimately the general public, the consumer and companies will deal with that. It's very early to tell. Uh, people are beginning to talk about, as I said, we've moved away from, you know, those comments around inflation, stimulus and other things to how does the economy, the global economy, including Australia, uh, react uh, to that change. Uh, and that's why I call it transition. I don't think anyone can be entirely certain. I think it is quite an uncertain world we live in at the moment around these themes, because history would again tell me, uh, based upon past evidence, is that consumers sometimes don't ultimately re react till they're well into the interest rate cycle. There's a lag before we see that effect. So again, uh, people are using, markets are highly efficient. Uh, they're traded every day by very smart people. They're traded quantitatively every day. So they're highly efficient. It's really where we sit uh, ultimately in addressing those themes um, and where the economies will ultimately rest Will we be able to, you know, the base case for Morgan Stanley is that we think that inflation will taper off over time. We're forecasting higher rates, naturally, in line with central bank policy. Um, but no one genuinely knows as yet, uh, as I said, I'm being a little bit repetitive, uh, in how the consumer will react. And what are the key lessons for investors in the lead up to the federal election, which is due, I think, around mid-May? And, and what do you anticipate for the remainder of 2022? Yeah, look, you know, obviously over, over time, Rob, I think that tug of war is going to play out. And, and I think what we're all really looking for is some clarity around uh, where uh, economies are going. Uh, I think the election... I don't think we'll pose too many major risks unless, of course, um, there's policies that I don't understand. Obviously, there hasn't been the formal um, formalisation of policies coming into the election. There's been talk around them, so it's pretty, uh, in a way, inappropriate for me to comment in that regard. Um, but the big things that do affect local economies are major changes to the taxation structure. Um, if you look at the last election, it was a big issue. Uh, and the voters voted the way they wanted to vote. Um, I don't see that occurring at this election. So I see the major issues facing investors in Australia are more around those global events uh, that are driving uh, our local economy. Australia is a very small part uh, of the world. It's a very small part of the global financial system. So global events tend to lead the Australian market, unless there is major reform and major restructure at a domestic economic level. And then from a private market standpoint, take us through how you're seeing investors respond to opportunities within this sector. 
Yeah, look, the, you know, the um, private markets are, or alternatives, private markets are a part of, all, of alternatives and private markets have grown enormously uh, over the last five years. In the early days and, you know, the initial uh, integration of uh, private equity funds into Australia was the ultra high net worth, the family office and the institutional investor. But that's definitely expanding and we're seeing across our client base greater and greater interest in private opportunities. They may be direct pre-IPO funds and we've done, uh, you know, some very successful transactions uh, in that area. We, we did 86400 uh, for clients, National Bank bought 86400. Uh, we recently raised uh, and supported a company called Chrysos, uh, which is a gold technology company, CSIRO driven technology, and that's been highly successful again for our clients. So again, clients want what I would call, as part of their portfolio, uncorrelated returns. Returns that are not correlated directly to publicly listed financial markets. Remembering one thing, that superannuation, superannuation assets in this country are long duration assets. So as part of their portfolio, it's natural to have a long duration asset sitting within one's portfolio within a super fund. That has to be managed according to, you know, to suitability and client suitability, that's very important. But the logic of having private investments in superannuation funds makes logical sense due to their long duration nature because in a lot of private funds and private opportunities, your money is locked up for a period. So you're trading liquidity over a four or five year period for genuine growth in one's portfolio. You mentioned alternatives there. I'd be interested to get a gauge on which asset classes within the broader alternative sphere uh, you're seeing opportunity for clients within. Yeah, obviously the latest one and, and the one we've seen a lot of inquiry on is crypto, naturally. Um, uh, our firm has a pretty conservative approach to crypto. Uh, the volatility in price worries us. You know, when you look at a cryptocurrency called a currency versus the volatility you would see in traditional currency markets, the volatility is quite extreme. So. Uh, again, uh, we're very cautious uh, around um, uh, our positioning for clients around crypto and we do take, as I said, a very conservative approach. The rise of ETFs and, and other things and, you know, obviously there's some very good asset managers in, a, in Australia that do offer specific ETFs around certain elements of commodities, maybe energy and maybe a group of stocks. And we've seen a lot of appetite again from our clients wanting to gain direct exposure to some of those listed products. They have liquidity and they give you uh, a great exposure to that. So uh, real estate is classified as an alternative. Um, our real estate exposure is uh, and has increased immensely. Uh, as an example, um, with one particular fund manager, we have over a billion dollars with that real estate fund manager. Uh, so again, our clients are broadening out uh, our, uh, their portfolios. It really is, again, probably part of what we tend to do and we want to do. We want to diversify clients' uh, portfolios. We want to match them with client suitability. In our retail clients in particular, we have a best interest duty. It's a regulatory duty that we need to give our clients. It's hard to justify a best interest duty if you've got a client just sitting in five equities. It needs to be diversified. And then I thought I'd get your understanding as to risk. What's the appetite for risk like internally within the wealth management division and how are you finding that clients are responding in the current environment to more risky or less risky opportunities? Yeah, risk is a very important subject. Um, and everyone, all our clients um, are different. Uh, everyone sits on a different point of their own life cycle. So risk needs to be assessed in line with a few things, multiple things, but client suitability is, is very important. What is a client's appetite for risk? So we really assess risk in a very deep way across all our client base. As an example, we have 15 risk officers dedicated in our business across 115 advisors. 
we've got an enormous investment in risk. And that risk department looks at things like client suitability. It naturally looks at market risk. We do a lot of lending that looks at credit risk. Our advisors naturally, regulatory wise, we look at conduct risk. So there's a lot of elements to that. And most importantly, that risk department looks at our operational risk as well. If something occurs, how is our business structured around operational risk? Part of that naturally uh, is the ability to assess cyber risk, which is growing every day. We're finding in our business the, the willingness to create fraud, the willingness to want to impersonate clients and people is becoming a big part of our business. So uh, our emphasis on risk at that level uh, is very high. And then on a broader scale, what do you see are the biggest issues or challenges facing Australia over the short to medium term? Look, I think macro-wise, um, when you look at the, you know, our country, we seem to have got through COVID pretty well. Um, yes, obviously, we're sitting on a, a large budget deficit that's going to take many years to, to work through, but we started in a strong position. Our balance sheet, if you like, relatively wise, is, is strong. We've also been the beneficiary of very strong terms of trade. You know, we've got an iron ore price of $160 a US tonne. We've got uh, very strong broader commodities uh, across our business. Um, obviously, we've got a trading partner uh, in China that um, is, um, at the moment, you know, we're working through some, some challenges. I feel confident that Australia will work through that those challenges. We have a, um, um, you know, a, a good commitment in our wealth business uh, to the Chinese community and we value that relationship uh, very, very highly. With regard um, to some broader risks across the economy, again, I see those, as I said a little bit earlier, I see those as being driven from offshore. The big question in my eyes around risks for everyone to face is that everyone's talked about this interest rate cycle rising and, and uh, in Australia obviously we're still committed to 10 basis points overnight still today but how is the consumer genuinely going to feel and the average Australian who owns a house with a mortgage when their four or five interest rate rises in? I don't think any of us know that and that's the unknown when you look back through history the overnight cash rate you know is traded at four and five and six percent now, we're at point one. Now, if you change that cash rate to 300 basis points or 3%, the effect on mortgage is, go is going to be enormous. And that's a risk. And I don't think the general public or the average Australian is thinking about that too closely at the moment. And that's a big unknown. If inflation continues and the central banks can't deal with inflation, and the other thing I'd observe about inflation as well is that the companies really haven't passed a lot of that on. They are, you know, if you look at the fertiliser industry and others, they're passing some of those prices increases on. Fuel prices in certain in industries are being passed on. The government's given the consumer massive tax relief for a period of time around excise, which I think is a good move uh, for the consumer. But the consumer hasn't felt the pain. The companies really don't know themselves ultimately where their earnings are going to sit. So I think that's, that's the risk. The risk is in the unknown. The psychological effect on how people are going to react into these price increases. And what we've seen in the past, and this is something I've learned over time, rate increases are absorbed for a period of time. They're absorbed in 2006, 7 and 8. They're absorbed in the period 87 through 90, but all of a sudden, at a point of time, comes a crunch when the consumer does react. And that's the unknown. At what point does that happen or at what point that will happen? I'm not sure. Before we move on, I'd be interested to get an understanding of the Morgan Stanley Wealth Management team. As I understand it, the business now has some 113 advisors, $41 billion of funds under management operating right across Australia. Take us through the structure of this division and, and how it's grown under your leadership over the past 20 years. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Look, I've been running the wealth business uh, since 2014. 
and I was lucky enough to, you know, to run the institutional business from 98 through about 18. But the wealth business has gone through a complete reshaping. Um, Steve Harker, uh, a dear friend, um, uh, came to me and said, look, Ian, you know, post a, post a management change, would you like to come down and, and run the wealth business? I was delighted to do it. I thought it was a great opportunity uh, looking out into the future. But when I looked at the business, it was an old-fashioned business. Um, it was stuck in, I would have thought, the early 90s as distinct from, you know, from really changing uh, over a period of time. And, and that's no criticism, that's just the way it was. It was operating well uh, and there were no issues. But we've completely, Rob, remodelled the wealth business. Um, the client offering has changed dramatically. We've invested aggressively in what's needed for clients. The client offering, research, investment solutions, approved products, really increased as well uh, the framework in which we manage our platforms. We, you know, we have a, a business across both retail clients and wholesale clients, so we cover both spectrums. We run two platforms. We run a specific retail platform for our retail clients and a specific high net worth global platform for our sophisticated and professional investors. We feel that, again, you need to provide an offering specific to the client demographic you want to service. So the offerings are different. But the business, um, in relation to the management team, for instance, that runs the business, you know, call it 80 people, the whole business has 290 people in it. Um, we basically started again with the management team. The management team has completely been replaced with Morgan Stanley culture and values, and, and that was the, one of the things we really wanted to establish in the business, is to build the Morgan Stanley culture, build values that people can be proud of, values the clients can be proud of when they're interacting as clients of our business. Because at the end of the day, you don't have a business without any clients. We run very quickly seven specific areas within our wealth management business. We've got our COO office uh, that looks at governance, um, operating aspects of our business, uh, also uh, does a range of work with regard to specific projects. We've got our advice management business naturally, uh, including the advisors. Uh, we run a very large marketing department to assist the advisors in the management of our business. Uh, we run an investment solutions team of nearly 20 people now. And their job is to create bespoke and opportunities specifically for our clients. Primarily more focused on our sophisticated clients than our retail clients and family offices, but a very, very bespoke offering within our investment solutions team. Uh, we run a specific non-for-profit business uh, in our business, uh, and that's dedicated to the servicing and provision of the not-for-profit sector in Australia. And then finally, we run BU Risk, which is which I talked about, 15 people managing the risk uh, of clients and the business broadly. I thought we'd briefly explore your background. You grew up in Melbourne and attended Haileybury College, as I mentioned in the opening. Take me through those formative years of your life, if you could, specifically your interest in both football and cricket, which I understand both sports you were uh, very talented in. Yeah, I'll put, you know, talent's relative, obviously. Um, so um, I'm, I wouldn't sort of definitely put myself out to be an elite sportsman, that's for sure. Uh, and many people will know that who's played golf with me, I can assure you. Look, my parents, interesting enough, you know, it, it's funny how you grow up. I classify my parents in those days, as many parents were, look, loving parents, but hands off. So yeah, they weren't that involved. A classic example would be on a Sunday, you know, you'd go out with a group of mates on your bike, you know, you'd leave home at about nine o'clock, you'd say goodbye to your mum, and mum would just say, be home before dinner. That's, that's, that's how it was. Um, no mobile phones, uh, importantly for a lot of parents, no tracking devices of their, of their kids, which I see a lot of today. Very different world. But, but what that did create, Rob, was independence, which I think is very important. You know, you weren't under the microscope the whole time and you're out on your own making decisions. So I think it was very healthy. It was a different world and, and, and I respect the challenges that the world faces now, but it was a very simple world. Um, and uh, look, I had a fabulous time, as I said. Uh, Bo Morris boy, look, I'm a 
and people who know me, um, I'm highly competitive. Shockingly competitive. Um, and, uh, and one thing children have actually bought me is actually the need to manage that competitiveness, which is a good thing, uh, actually. But, you know, that... And that played out in my sport. You know, my father played uh, first-class cricket for Victoria. He was involved in the Victorian cricket side for many years. My grandfather, who was alive when I was in those formative years, he played then VFL football uh, for both Geelong. He played in the Geelong First Premiership side in 1925. He also wear, wore the big V that most people would know uh, in Victoria. So I came from a very sporting family. Um, and, and I had that, you know, that natural competitive instinct uh, built into me. As I understand it, you enrolled in a Bachelor of Business degree at RMIT University, graduating in 1982. What prompted the interest in business and where did you see your future heading at that early part of your career? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, funny enough, actually, when I was, you know, probably in my early teens, my father, uh, who had some relationships in the finance industry just, you know, through, through friends, bought a, f a couple of shares and put them in my name. Um, Cadbury Schweppes, I remember. Herald and Weekly Times was the other one. I remember them vividly. And I liked them. I watched them in the newspapers every day. And funny enough, when, you know, like I remember asking my father, where do I see these? And he'd point me to the, the Herald Sun that had the, uh, you know, the, the shares in the column and I'd watch them every day. And then I began to look at these other companies that were sitting there and I used to watch the plus and minuses each day, shares going up, shares going down. And the ones that interested me were the ones, of course, with the pluses, not the minuses. So I, I, I gained an interest and I liked it. Uh, and, uh, and it was something that always interested me. And, and from my mother's side, you know, they, they ran some businesses. Um, so, you know, they, you know, my mother's family and her, and her extended family, uh, you know, ran some quite successful businesses. So, you know, there was always that element around discussion around business um, at the dinner table or, or in other areas. And upon graduation, what were, what were some of those early positions you held, were they in business, were they in banking and finance? Take us through, say, that early to mid-1980s period of your life. Yeah, now, when I left uni, it was quite interesting, actually. When I left uni, and a very good friend of mine, actually, um, uh, in Melbourne, his name's Graham Billings, and uh, he interviewed me, uh, funny enough, he's an old Harlebury boy as well, and funny enough, he was the interview person um, for Coopers and Lybrand. So, uh, I knew Graham, and Graham knew me, and... Um, uh, it wasn't difficult to get a job at Coopers and Lowbrand, so I fell into that job. And I must say, it was a fantastic experience. Coopers and Lowbrand in those days was an outstanding firm. It was run by uh, a leader, uh, a late leader called Ross Heron. He was a very, very good businessman, and he took me under his wing, and, as did Graham. And I was part of their audit division. And the thing that I really enjoyed is I saw a vast, different array of companies. The great thing about an order, auditor is it gets you an entree into understanding, the true understanding of industry and the true, true understanding of how companies operate. Breaking down their unit cost. You know, I did the audit of firms like Philip Morris, uh, who were then listed uh, in Australia, they're now not listed. I did a range of insurance companies uh, and I got to know investment managers and other things and we'd chat. When I was doing those audi or, um, auditing assignments, I, I can remember doing an audit of Guardian Assurance and I chatted very, very at length to their investment manager. I spent time in their safe counting scripts. As, as auditors do. You get to know uh, what's doing. But I found that period of time incredibly valuable because the learning and understanding of companies and economies is vitally important in financial markets. If you don't understand companies and you don't understand economies, it's very difficult, really, um, to have credibility in financial markets. So I use that time at Coopers uh, as a platform. So by 1992, you joined ABN AMRO in the position of Head of Equity Distribution, a role you held for some six years. Walk us through what this role entailed in a day-to-day -day context and what the prevailing market conditions were like in the 90s. Obviously, there was significant volatility and, and turbulence. Yeah, a lot of change in the 90s. I'd spent time at Deutsche Bank before that. It was called Bain & Company then, and I was within the institutional business, and I started originally 
at BZW, um, a really good person, Steve Crane, hired me uh, uh, to, to help build their Melbourne office. The Melbourne office needed building and I set about building that office. Um, but the 90s was an extraordinary period. Um, started pretty close on, obviously, with the recession in Australia. We had the breakdown of the Soviet Union uh, in 91. Uh, you had genuinely the advent of globalisation. Uh, as an example, um, China at the time, in 1990, was 2% of the world's manufacturing output. By the end of that decade, in 2000, they were 7%. So China was really beginning to extend its, its position in the world and, and, of course, that had very positive, ultimately positive ramifications for Australia through our iron ore industry and others that, uh, that others developed. Um, we also had, very importantly, in the 90s, compulsory superannuation. Round about 92, I may be out a little bit there, but I think it's round about 92 compulsory super came in and that changed the landscape. So the 90s was, I think, the pillars in a lot of way to how society looks today. Uh, I think ultimately um, we also see um, in that the massive growth in technology. Technology was really changing globally. You know, I think we had Google, late 90s, 97, 98. So the world was really changing. The mobile phone was, develop was developing at a fast rate. Text messaging, uh, famous text messaging, uh, was becoming uh, embedded into society. So I see the 90s as a pillar for growth um, into the future. You know, there wasn't, when you look through the 90s, the period post the recession, 92 through uh, 2000, we had an Asian crisis in 98. But markets were pretty positive. Um, it was that cycle again. When I look at cycles in markets, you know, they traditionally go for five, six, seven years, um, and then natural cycles uh, begin to correct themselves as excesses get built in to those cycles. So when I look at the 90s, I look positively. The other thing about I would observe about uh, the 90s in particular is that we were domestically focused from an investment perspective. We were in the privatisation uh, cycle. Um, CBA started that off. Uh, Qantas, uh, partial sale in Qantas around 94, and of course Telstra uh, in about 97. Big privatisations. The world wasn't focused on global investing. You know, one of the real um, achievements and developments about global investing uh, was Kerr Nielsen's building of platinum asset management in 94, opening the eyes to the investors uh, of what global investing uh, could lead to. And he was a pioneer uh, in that area. And we have enormous respect for Kerr and what he developed uh, over that period of time. So again, I go back to that point. It wasn't so much about dealing, Rob, with crisis um, and issues. It was about, in a way, uh, working our way through, which was broadly a positive cycle um, for, uh, for investment. So that now brings us on to Morgan Stanley, one of the world's largest and most successful banking institutions and an organisation that you joined in 1998 to establish their domestic equity presence in the Australian market. Take us through the launch of this division of the business and then the strategy that you employed to try and achieve growth. It's been a fabulous journey, uh, I must say, and it, and it all started really... Um with a conversation I had with Steve Harker. Uh, Steve was appointed by Morgan Stanley to be the CEO uh, of Australia. Uh, Steve approached me. We'd worked together for BZW in London, um, but we'd also been uh, working together at BZW in Australia, and uh, he was someone I respected and trusted uh, immensely. Uh, I can remember, funny enough, um, with Steve doing the Australian business plan, um, on the kitchen table of our house in Mossman. Uh, so uh, there were some uh, very interesting times in working our way through that. You can, again, Rob, just remember how greenfield businesses are built. We had no dealing desk. Uh, we, we had no institutional facilities. So again, we had to, to build all those and building those in 98 is a lot different than building them today. Technology can be implemented in a business a lot quicker today uh, than, it was, uh, than it was then. But our strategy was really about um, having a value proposition. 
What is our core competency in our business? Um, let's build out that credibility. Um, we hired some really good early people uh, in our business, some ex-employees of Morgan Stanley. Um, our first two hires in the business was a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Matthew Donald, outstanding person, great, uh, great trader, uh, great sales trader with clients, highly respected. We hired a young guy called Will McKenzie that now is no longer a young guy and he's managing our institutional business. Um, but both of them had great pedigree uh, as people. So it's about building core competence, but about hiring good people and about having a clear strategy. And I've always been a believer in that. Have a strategy, make sure that strategy is measurable not motherhood. So you measure your strategy. And I must say Morgan Stanley were patient, supportive, um, great people within Morgan Stanley. And uh, uh, they assisted and really supported that growth over a long period of time. Today, you know, we started with nothing. Uh, we've now got number two or 3% market share of, of over 9%. In fairness, no other other firm has done it this way. Um, there's, a two, there's a couple trying now, and, uh, and they're full of good people. Um, so we'll wait and see how that ends. But, you know, we faced, again, the one thing about institutional businesses, um, they're highly competitive. Uh, the competition um, does not rest. Um, and that suited me. I enjoyed that. Uh, going back to that background, I love the competition. So that didn't worry me. Um, I'm not preoccupied by the competition. I'm more worried about us. Um, and once we'd built that core competency, we then began to diversify the business. And this was critical. We diversified the business into derivatives, structured products. But most importantly, the defining moment is building a prime brokerage business. Because the thing about equity businesses, you don't make a lot of money out of cash sales and trading. The PBT of an institutional equities business is driven by prime brokerage. And it's a very important part of the business. And fast forward to 2014, which you mentioned earlier, you became head of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management here in Australia. Reflecting on this division of the business, how have clients' needs evolved and then how has the business evolved alongside those needs? Yeah, it's, arguably, it's arguable that the needs of the client haven't really changed. Um, and perhaps those clients should have been serviced with those needs earlier. Because again, uh, wealth management I see is a very important pillar in the life cycle of a person. But the offering has changed dramatically. We still have in our business, and, and we have outstanding equity specialists. There is nothing wrong with being an equity specialist. And again, the competition in Australia, I respect immensely, so there's no criticism there. But we, we want to run our own business and our, and our business is around holistic wealth management. So we believe in diversified asset allocation, which minimises market risk. We believe in highly technical portfolio construction that suits the asset allocation. And we also look very, very closely at client suitability as to are we delivering what the client wants. Now, if a client comes in and wants and they just want to trade equities, that's fine. Uh, we, you know, we probably see an obligation at some point to try and steer the client in the, in the direction that we feel um, best suits their interests. But again, if they want to specialise in certain aspects, we can counter for that. Whereas a family office, for instance, that sits within our wealth business really needs a quasi-style institutional offering. Our wealth business can offer prime brokerage. Not many wealth firms can. There's a, one other in Australia that can do that. Um, but that's a very important offering uh, to those family offices. Um, those family offices require sophisticated product, the very best of Morgan Stanley globally. As an example, it's fabulous to have what we call um, our big brother in the US. You know, 16, 17,000 advisors, uh, well over uh, three, three trillion in assets, big business, very big business. Um, and, we, and we gain an enormous amount from them. As an example, they have this large team that sits within their um, uh, CIO, CIO's office and investment management that specialises in alternatives as well. Our team on the ground here 
are constantly talking to them in search of the very, very best products that suit the needs of our clients. So again, as our offering has become more sophisticated, our clients, I feel, are getting a much better service than they did seven years ago. And that, and that evolution around what I call holistic wealth management is very important. If I recall correctly, the, this particular division of Morgan Stanley is growing here in Australia by about five to 700 new clients per year. What's driving that growth? What, what, has the profile changed at all? Look, our profile has changed, clearly. Um, you know, when I started in wealth management, uh, as an example, in 2014, we had this global platform that we called our PWM platform, uh, but it wasn't really suited to Australia. For instance, it didn't even recognise franking credits in those days. Well, sophisticated client, no franking credits, pretty hard in a way to justify uh, at that time. Um, it didn't have the ability to invest in Australian mutual funds. So first of all, what we had to do was build out our infrastructure, and this has been our, our approach to the business, a bit like our institutional business, build our core capability spend time investing in the core capability of the business before you start delivering it to clients. So the period 14 through 17 was genuine reshaping of the business. Investing in platform, investing in teams, restructuring the management style. And from 2018 to today, it's now about leveraging that capability that operating leverage, leveraging that fixed cost we've put into the business and helping, most importantly, our advisors in winning new business. So it's a long-winded way, Rob, of answering your question. Um, it's a combination of winning market share and having Australia begin to understand Morgan Stanley in a better way. We're not a firm. We're a conservative firm with our culture as well. We don't beat our chest out everywhere. We're very different than that. You mentioned advisors there. Mid last year it was announced that for the fourth year in a row, Morgan Stanley Financial Advisors recognised in the well regarded Barron's list of the top 100 financial advisors, with I think 20 representatives of Morgan Stanley included in that top 100 list, which is obviously an extraordinary achievement. I'd be interested to hear your view as to how you've attracted that level of talent to the business and what makes a good financial advisor. Look, we are proud of our advisors. I feel they do an outstanding job. I have an enormous amount of respect for them. It's a tough job. <laughs> it was that easy, Rob. You and me would be at home. You and me would be at home just trading markets. It ain't that easy. Uh, it's a tough job and I respect them immensely. They work hard. They work long hours. Um, they care about their job. Um, yes, we did have to reshape the network. Um, and I think pound for pound, um, I'm a bit biased, obviously, being at Morgan Stanley. Um, but I feel we have the best network in the country um, for what we do. Other networks are larger, and I respect those domestic firms. Uh, but in what we do, and I think Barron's is very much um, um, a reflection, I think, on how I see our network uh, as being uh, uh, the leader uh, in that. Are there any other growth sectors or opportunities you're seeing at a macro level? You know, we're very committed to ESG. Our previous head of research, Nathan Lim, uh, we hired from Australian Ethical. He's just recently taken on um, a very large job in Asia uh, for Morgan Stanley. So um, he was a real leader in that field. Uh, Alex Ventilon, our new head of research, uh, is still committed uh, very much to providing necessary screens. Uh, we, we've got some specialised portfolios um, that we deliver for clients. Uh, some of our large philanthropic clients, for instance, demand, uh, and correctly demand, uh, mind you, certain screens to be overlaid in portfolios so they're getting the correct ESG coverage. Uh, we provide that. We do research on ESG funds. Uh, so we've got a very, very big commitment uh, to ESG across the business. Um, I see it as only growing. Mining companies are beginning to adjust. Uh, you look at what's occurring in the energy space. Uh, mining companies are beginning to adjust, and some of those companies uh, that are developing ESG profiles and new technologies, um, you know, uh, have to be applauded. 
One of the most fundamental issues dominating discussion at a board and executive level throughout corporate Australia and throughout the world at the moment is diversity. I know it's something that you're passionate about. Why is it so important to you and how's it being implemented here at Morgan Stanley? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question uh, and a very topical one. Diversity is very important to Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley has uh, five um, core values across its business globally. Um, the commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, is very important to our firm. It's very important uh, to our senior management in the US, including our CEO, James Gorman. And it's important to us in Australia. Our business... Um, across its 290 odd employees has at the moment uh, slightly in excess of 40% gender diversity. You've now been at Morgan Stanley for some 23 years. Reflecting on that period, what have been your biggest achievements and what are the key lessons that you've learned? Oh, look, the achievements are, have been um, primarily team orientated. It's about we, not me. Yeah, look, that's a cliche, but... Um, it's the people that deliver the performance. So to all those institutional people who've built the business um, and now led by Will McKenzie doing an outstanding job, um, full credit to them. We set the course. We may be, you know, you know, I'm a great believer in positioning the business strategically. Very important. But again, that strategic vision has to be achievable. Yeah, no point chasing... I use this phrase a bit in, and people have heard me say, no point chasing a mirage. It doesn't work. You need to be a combination of strategic and practical operating within your business. And that's how we think about our business and that's been part of the driver. Some of the lessons learned, um, be resilient. Um, it's an often used word. I'm not sure. It's an often used word, but I'm not sure how often it's actually uh, dealt with properly. But it's tough. You know, building an organic business takes time. You know, if you're thinking of building an organic business in three years, you're dreaming. Um, it took Morgan Stanley um, probably 10 to 15 years to build the institutional business they want. By 2010, it was in good shape. From 98 to 2010, it was in good shape. From 2010 to 2022, it's an outstanding business. It really is a good business. It's changed again change with the times. Some of the personal lessons I've learnt um, are a few things, um, and even I do this at times. Um, listening is way more important than speaking. I'll tell you a funny story. In, in the early days in, in stockbroking, um, I was lucky enough to have two really good mentors, very senior people. Um, Jeff Dewar, who was National Mutual CIO at the time. Barry Laws, who was the CIO of Colonial and then went to a, a smaller firm for Equity Life. I remember ringing up Barry one day. He's a fabulous guy, Barry. And um, I said, how am I going? Yeah, I want feedback, you know, I want feedback. And he said, do you really want feedback? I said, I want feedback. He said, Ian, your service is rubbish. I said, why is it rubbish? And he went through a whole lot of... And he went through a whole lot... You know, from a senior CIO, he gave me the blueprint on what he wanted. And Jeff Dewar, who was a dear friend, did the same thing. So, again, don't be frightened of feedback. A lot of young people get defensive. You need... That's one of the lessons I've learned. You are never good enough or big enough to take feedback from people. And I learned valuable, valuable lessons in that. The second thing I'd say is that this industry, very rare. People do $100 million deals every day in the stock market on the phone. There's no contract. It's just, um, you know, firms obviously have tapes that give you some protection, but trust across wealth management with clients and a trust institutional clients is imperative. And the one thing I would give anyone advice on is never trade your integrity. I've seen people trade their integrity. I've experienced it. I just turn away. Because this industry works on that integrity. And, that, and, that's, and that's one thing that I would say to everyone in our industry. In closing out our discussion, where do you see wealth management heading as an industry? And the second part of that is, what does the next five or ten years look like for Ian Chambers? Look, in terms of the industry, I'm very bullish the wealth industry. Australia, via heritage and via its original landowners that we respect immensely, is an old country. 
But from a wealth perspective, we're very young. You know, we haven't been creating wealth in this country for a long period because we've had a, quite a small population. Large landscape, small population. So to me, I'm very bullish, uh, the wealth industry. Life expectancy is only increasing, which means the last thing you want to do is get to the age of 65 and not have your wealth managed properly and find it tough for the latter years of your life. So I see wealth as a very important service. We provide a, a broader client base. You can see I take it, take it very seriously. Technology will continue uh, to build into the business. There is no doubt. We're using a lot of technology around our risk management, for an example. Uh, we use AI naturally uh, to look at risk metrics to do uh, certain things and analyse portfolios, analyse statements of advice, uh, really looking at that, at that part of the business. So that's going to continue to grow. Uh, the better probably point is what's going to happen with Robo. It'll be more developed in five years' time than it is now. Um, but again, you know, like a specialist doctor, like a specialist lawyer, um, I think you'll want to see a person. Uh, so I think I don't see any risks ultimately to the provision of people becoming advisors and wanting to do that at a face-to-face -face level. I think that's very important. I don't think that'll change. Um, bull markets hide many cracks. And I think the true test of our industry will be when markets turn down and markets ultimately at some point will turn down. So I see an industry cutting to the point, growing, service offering becoming more sophisticated, technology being built into more and more businesses and clients really beginning um, to question, particularly X, a bull market, uh, what they're ultimately getting. Ian Chambers, Managing Director of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management Australia. Fantastic insights and it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. Look forward to the future. Thanks for your time. Yeah, delighted, Robin. Look, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Greatly appreciate it.